Welcome, everybody, to the Meet the EFF panel. Um, thank you all for coming. We understand that we're up against uh, General uh, Alexander, so it's a, it's a tight competition, and we're glad you all decided to uh, spend your noon hour with us. Uh, so thanks for being here. So this is the, uh, the Meet the EFF panel. Uh, we're going to go and have brief uh, introductions from each of our uh, panelists who represent uh, some of the EFF uh, folks who are working to defend your uh, civil liberties. Um, actually, a quick uh, show of hands. How many people here are uh, members or otherwise very close to familiar with the EFF? Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, for those who, who don't know much about the EFF, uh, you'll learn a little bit today. We are a civil liberties nonprofit that fights to defend your rights online, privacy, free speech, uh, and uh, innovation policy, try and make the world safe for security research to do their research and talk about it. Um, and we're here today to answer uh, your questions about what we do. We have uh, a great selection of panelists. We might not have the particular person who works on the issue you have a question about, but we'll do our best. Um, and one thing I wanted to say is uh, if you have a question that's specific to some situation that you're in, uh, this is not really the forum for those kinds of questions. One of the things we do is we provide counseling to, to people who need it pro bono, uh, but this is not the forum for those types of questions because we would want to make sure that if you did have such a question uh, that it was uh, in a confidential, privileged uh, manner. Uh, but for general questions about what we're doing, cases we're working on, policy issues, this is, this is the place for that. Uh, before I, I begin, I just wanted to play for you a, a short video that we created uh, to, uh, to support uh, to coders' rights. Um, and this is, uh, well, let me just uh, let it play and then we'll uh, introduce the panel. Thank you, thank you. Uh, the production quality is, I understand, not, not very high, but that's because when you donate to EFF, your money is going mostly to programs and not to video production quality. <laughs> All right, so uh, let me start off by introducing myself. I'm Kurt Opsahl. I'm a senior staff attorney at EFF. Uh, I work on a wide range of, of issues. Um, probably uh, the most prominent thing I've worked on lately was uh, representing uh, Matt Inman, the creator of The Oatmeal. Uh, in a dispute that he had with Funny Junk and an attorney named Charles Carrion. Uh, I can tell you a little bit more about that in, in the Q&A session if people are curious. And let me turn it over to Eva. Uh, hi there. Uh, my name is Eva Galperin. I am... I'm trying. Here we go. Let's try this again. Uh, hi there. My name is Eva Galperin. I am the International Freedom of Expression Coordinator at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, I think I'm the only uh, member of the international team here, so if you have questions about what goes on in the rest of the world, uh, state-sponsored surveillance by authoritarian regimes and such, uh, I am the person to talk to. Do it. Hey everybody, I'm Hanny Fakuri. I'm a staff attorney uh, with the EFF. Um, my focus is on criminal law. And uh, uh, recently we've, uh, or the, some of the work I've been working on has included um, some work on cell site location data. And we just recently filed a brief in a Washington state uh, criminal case uh, challenging the constitutionality of Washington state's uh, cyber stalking statute as a uh, First Amendment uh, violation because it covers a lot of protected speech. So yeah, thanks for having us. 
Hi, everybody. Uh, my name's Trevor Tim. I'm an activist at EFF, and I do a lot of work on free speech issues and government secrecy and surveillance. Uh, so we could talk about uh, WikiLeaks or um, surveillance drones coming to the U.S. And given that General Alexander is in the next room, uh, we can also talk about our NSA warrantless wiretapping um, s lawsuit that's been going on for six years. And just a reminder that actually just a week ago today, the NSA admitted for the first time that they violated the Constitution in a letter to Senator Ron Wyden. So we can talk about that too. Uh, I'm Peter Eckersley. I'm Technology Projects Director. Uh, I work on a range of issues um, from a computer science sort of perspective. The big uh, ambitious thing that our team is working on over the, the, the next three or five years is encrypting the entire web. Um, and we have a few projects that are um, helping to do that, and we've got a few more in the pipeline. Um, HTTPS Everywhere, the SSL Observatory, Sovereign Keys. So if you have questions about encryption um, or if you have software projects more generally, um, you can ask them. Hey there. My name is Marsha Hoffman. I'm a senior staff attorney at EFF. Uh, I work on the civil liberties team. And um, I, I consider myself kind of a generalist. I work on privacy, free speech issues, um, our coders' rights project, which um, you know, works to ensure that security researchers can, can do the awesome cutting edge uh, work that they do without running afoul of the law. Um, a couple of things that I've worked on recently include our um, request, uh, our requests to um, the Copyright Office to grant um, exemptions to the Digital Millennium Copyright Act to make sure that people can legally uh, jailbreak phones and tablets and video game consoles. Um, I also have done some work on uh, a case that we're handling right now. Our client is uh, a telecommunications company that was the recipient of a national security letter, and we are representing that company in, uh, in, a, in its challenge to that letter and the associated gag order. Um, I um, also have been involved in a, a couple of amicus briefs we filed in, in cases in the past year or so. Um, involving attempts by the government to force people to decrypt data um, and the question of whether the Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination applies in situations like that. Um, I know that last year here there were a lot, a lot, a lot of questions about that and I suspect that you may still be interested in that and I would just flag that I'm actually giving a talk about that, that topic only on that topic in a couple of hours and so um, if you have questions about that you might choose to wait um, and uh, go to that talk but if you want to ask questions about that here that's cool too, whatever. I'm just going to jump in quickly. Two other fun topics that uh, people can ask questions about if they want. Uh, one is uh, the phenomenon of Apple's crystal prison and all the other lockdown devices uh, that we're, we're facing, particularly with modern mobile devices and what we're trying to do about that. Uh, and the other is open wireless networks and encrypting open wireless networks so that you don't have uh, um, the, the, so that you don't have to lock uh, people out of your network in order to be safe from eavesdropping. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, panelists. And so let's, uh, uh, sorry, we can start with your questions. Uh, unfortunately, we do not have a, a mic for the audience, so uh, I'll ask you to say your questions and then I will repeat them uh, so that everybody can hear the question clearly. And those who don't have loud voices maybe want to come up and be close to Kurt so he can hear you. Yeah. Uh, well, let's start out with you, uh, sir, in the front row. So the question is uh, about the uh, NSA uh, warrantless wiretapping lawsuit, and the question is, who are we representing? Trevor, you want to take that, or I, I can take it as well? Yeah, you go ahead. Uh, so we have two lawsuits related to the NSA warrantless wiretapping. Uh, the first one we filed was against uh, AT&T for its uh, cooperation and collaboration with the program. Uh, and in that case, it was a class action. Uh, so we had a representative set of uh, plaintiffs who were AT&T customers. Uh, that was based a lot on uh, some information that a whistleblower provided to us uh, about the Folsom Street facility, which is a facility in San Francisco where in which there was a room uh, built into the facility containing a splitter that would uh, split the signal and send one copy of it off to the NSA and the rest uh, routed to its destination. Uh, and so these were customers whose communications had gone through uh, that facility. The second lawsuit uh, was uh, uh, 
filed against the government itself, against the NSA and other elements of the governments that were participating in the, in the program. Uh, and in that case, um, we were trying to get, um, well, a couple of things. We, we had this uh, same set of, uh, of plaintiffs who were saying they were injured by it because their communications had been splintered off. Uh, and we're also trying to get a ruling there that, that what they're doing is unconstitutional. Get a ruling at least on the merits of what is done. Um, as far as the question, um, you say, you know, what's the injury, what's the damages? One of the things that is provided in uh, a variety of the statutes, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act and uh, Electronic Communications Privacy Act and such, are uh, statutory damages, uh, damages that are set by law, uh, where Congress recognized that sometimes uh, damages for privacy violations may be hard to prove uh, and set that forth in the, in the statute. Hey, um, just to add on to that a little bit, um, as far as as far as how do we know this is going on, um, it, you know, af after the New York Times reported on it in 2005, you know, dozens of major news organizations um, reported the same thing, and this evidence has been kind of in the public record for uh, you know six years now. And uh, even after Congress passed the FISA Amendments Act, which is actually going through Congress right now um, for renewal, which we are uh, strenuously opposing uh, because it really instead of strengthening privacy protections in the wake of the scandal, it actually weakened them for Americans talking to people overseas. Um, but even after that passed, uh, there's been numerous reports that the NSA is still um, collecting just purely American domestic communications. The New York Times in 2009 said that they had been doing it still in a systematic way. Uh, Wired just reported uh, a few months ago, I'm sure many of you saw, about the massive data center they're building in Utah, which they plan to store um, basically every email sent um, around the world. And uh, William Binney, who's actually on a panel here um, later this weekend, uh, he it was an NSA, longtime NSA employee, and uh, he actually just joined our case, one of three NSA whistleblowers to uh, present evidence in our uh, warrantless wiretapping case against the NSA. Um, so the evidence is, is vast, and uh, yet still the government has yet to allow us to present that evidence in court. Um, so the, the follow-on question is, uh, did we have a discovery and to get further evidence from that? And the answer is no, we did not actually get to do discovery. Uh, the case, even though it's been six years, is still in the preliminary stages. Uh, they have, uh, well, there's two cases. So the first case uh, was moving forward. They tried to get the case dismissed. That failed. Uh, and then uh, went to Congress to get retroactive immunity given to the telecoms. Uh, there was a big battle in Congress over that, but unfortunately, uh, telecom immunity did pass. Uh, and we fought the constitutionality of that uh, and took that to uh, the appeals court as well, but that unfortunately was not uh, successful. I mean, it's flattering when you have your case case being specifically uh, talked about at the highest levels of government and they pass a special law just to kill your case. But nevertheless, that doesn't get us any closer to a ruling on the merits. Uh, and then the second case uh, against the uh, uh, NSA and the government, uh, the state secrets privilege was asserted. Um, and so we need to uh, resolve whether or not uh, the state secret privilege prevents us from moving forward with the case uh, before we go any further. So we're, we're a long way uh, from, from that sort of uh, thing. All right, uh, another question. Um, sir. Um, so the question, let me just repeat the question. Uh, the question was about uh, SSL decryption devices placed outside a network so people can look at SSL communications, perhaps to find uh, malware, uh, but also uh, examining the communications. Uh, so this is a, I, I won't say totally common, but it's a thing that a, um, a decent number of companies do. They install these, uh, these devices and then they go around to their employees' machines 
um, and add a root certificate um, that's tr that they, they, they make that a trusted certificate for each of the uh, devices that's on that network. And then every device, whenever it makes a TLS connection, uh, gets man in the middle. Um, the, the key it sees isn't the true key for the server it's trying to talk to, so it, it does a, a handshake with the, uh, the firewall, and the firewall gets to read the contents of the encrypted communications. Um, I'm not a lawyer. So I'm not going to give you the, uh, the legal analysis of this, and maybe one of my, my colleagues will. But I will say that doing this um, without getting very clear, explicit consent from all of the employees who are affected by such a device is extremely risky. Do you want to? Okay. And then the, the sub part of the question was, was about the, uh, the legality of it. Um, so. There are a number of laws that uh, affect uh, when you can uh, uh, eavesdrop on communications, most prominently the Wiretap Act, um, which is a federal law. Uh, the Wiretap Act uh, requires um, uh, one party consent. Uh, however, a lot of state laws require all party consent. Um, and so one would certainly be wise, as, as Peter is suggesting, to get consent uh, of all parties to a communication uh, before uh, intercepting it. There's also uh, a provider exception that allows a provider to do things uh, to protect their networks, uh, but uh, you know, that would have to be that for someone who is a provider of it. So, I mean, I, I hate to say it, it's often the, the case with these sort of legal questions, but uh, it depends and check with counsel is probably the, the best answer. I'll take another uh, another question. Sir. Okay, so to, to repeat the question, uh, the question is about Tor and other anonymizing uh, technologies uh, which may sometimes be used by people uh, like child pornographers or other uh, malfeasors. And the question is, does that affect how we, we feel about the technology and how we, uh, how we react to it? Uh, so uh, from a legal perspective, um, I think that this is uh, something that comes up in our discussions when we think about which cases to take. Because what we're trying to do um, on our legal team is try to pick the best cases that we possibly can uh, to create a really good impact in the law that's going to help a lot of people, right? And so, um, you know, w when a case comes up that we're thinking about maybe getting involved in, in one way or another, um, you know, and, and it involves child porn, for example, that's certainly one of these things that we take into account. Um, because I feel that often in cases like that, the judge is really going to want to bend over backwards to make sure that person gets punished, right? And sometimes I think that that creates the possibility that the judge is going to bend over backwards to sort of torture the legal analysis to make sure that that person um, gets punished. And we worry that that could have a greater impact on a whole bunch of other people that isn't going to be so great. Um, to give you an example that actually does not involve child porn, how many of you are familiar with the Lori Drew case? Anybody? So several years ago, I'll bet, you, I'll bet you a lot of you read about this, several years ago there was this really awful thing that happened where um, a woman um, set up a fake MySpace account, uh, imposed as a young boy, and then um, uh, you know, f you know, became um, you know, connected to uh, 
a, a friend of, of this woman's daughter's. And, you know, the, the daughter was all excited that this, you know, this good-looking guy was into her and all of this. And um, then, you know, the, the woman basically kind of, you know, her fake persona turned on the girl and said all sorts of terrible things to her. And the girl became very, very depressed and she committed suicide. And it was, it was a terrible, terrible thing. And um, there were a number of prosecutors who looked very hard at that situation and I, I think they thought, you know what, somehow that should be illegal. Um, and they looked into it and they couldn't really find any laws that they could prosecute her under. And so one prosecutor had this idea that maybe they could use the, the federal hacking law, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, to go after this woman on the theory that um, when she signed up for a fake MySpace account, she violated MySpace's terms of service and in so violating the terms of service, she was gaining unauthorized access to MySpace's servers and therefore was guilty of uh, violating the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. And they, they, you know, they pursued a felony charge against her. Now the problem with that is um, if that woman um, is guilty of a crime for violating terms of service, then that's going to be the case for all of us. And you've read these things, right? I mean, or you haven't, and that's part of the problem, right? I mean, you could be guilty of a crime for violating something that you never read and you don't even know what's in it. And of course that would be a big problem. And um, so we, we got involved in that case as an amicus and ultimately a judge found in that case that it, it just couldn't be the case that violating terms of service turns you into a, a criminal. Um, and we thought that was a very, very good outcome. But you know, I, I think that this demonstrates, uh, at, at least from, from our perspective as a, as, a, as a legal organization, how difficult it is sometimes to deal with those sorts of things because you're, you're right, on the one hand, you know, somebody's been accused of something really, really bad and often they, they, you know, it appears that they've done something really, really bad and perhaps as a society, you know, we say we want to punish that but we also want to be careful not to uh, do it in such a way that it, it, uh, it moves the law in a direction that could affect um, a lot more of us that are not even implicated in that case. Eva, do you have something you want to add? Hmm? No. Okay. Then I'll take another uh, another question. Well, let me see if I can get somebody right, there in the middle, sir. Okay. So the, the question is, uh, the gentleman comes from Spain. Uh, there are some protests who are organizing through social media. And do we have some uh, experience in helping protesters internationally uh, who are protesting uh, using social media? Um, well, the, the work that EFF does internationally is um, a little bit different from the work that we do domestically because uh, we do not have lawyers in every country, so we don't, um, we, we don't actually litigate uh, internationally. But what we do do is um, we work with uh, activists on the ground uh, in order to help them, uh, to help them organize and, uh, and oppose these kinds of laws. Uh, and we work with uh, the organizations that already exist in the country in a sort of partnership uh, in order to uh, give them our, our support and sort of move the, um, our, uh, our many members towards this issue. Uh, a lot of countries have, have actually looked at uh, criminalizing certain kinds of speech uh, in social media, uh, including the state of Veracruz in, uh, in Mexico. And uh, I, I think there's also a similar law in India. And recently there was uh, the Twitter joke trial in, uh, in the UK um, where a, uh, a, a British citizen joked uh, about, uh, about blowing up a, a plane over Ireland and uh, was taken to court um, for, uh, I, I think it was, I think today, was it today? Possibly yesterday, uh, that um, he, he had been convicted and he uh, went on appeal and was, uh, was acquitted today. 
so we do we do work with people all over the world, and and we certainly oppose these kinds of laws, and and try to try to uh, draw attention to them when they uh, when they happen. <laughs> Okay, uh, next question. Um, I'll take uh, at the end. Um, yeah, just kind of to follow up, mm -hmm. tell me a little bit more about collaboration between the EFF in the USA and the EFF in other countries. Oh, there, uh, there so is no... So let me no, just re re repeat uh, yeah. the question and then... Oh, uh, the question is uh, if, I, if I could uh, elaborate on the collaboration between EFF in the United States and EFF in other countries. Um, EFF is not divided up in, uh, by country. There is just one EFF. It's, you know, 30-something of us sitting in an office in San Francisco. Uh, but our reach is international because uh, the internet is international. Um, what we do is we, uh, we collaborate with other organizations uh, such as the Online Rights Group in the UK. Uh, we uh, work with uh, NAWAT in Tunisia. Uh, we work with uh, an organization called Global Voices, which uh, which helps to um, give voice to, to bloggers all over the world and sort of highlight times when, uh, when they're in danger for things that they say online. Uh, we've worked with the Committee to Protect Journalists. Um, and, and there are many sort of EFF-like organizations uh, all over the world, and we try to uh, encourage their formation and uh, work with them to oppose uh, bad laws in their countries. There are a few organizations called Electronic Frontiers, like there's Electronic Frontiers Finland, Electronic Frontiers Australia, um, and those are, are you know fellow travelers, but they are not uh, directly affiliated. We don't have uh, like they're not um, branch offices. Uh, so uh, I'll take a, another question. Um, see, in the back there. So the question was about uh, battles about uh, 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 throttling bandwidth um, and uh, where, where ISPs uh, have, uh, well, ISPs being asked not to uh, connect to, uh, to certain websites, which I think may be a, a reference to some of the ICE uh, seizures of uh, domain names, um, and I guess a reference to uh, uh, throttling of uh, a BitTorrent by certain um, uh, networks. Um, Peter, you want to talk to that part? Sure. Uh, so uh, we did a lot of work a, a few years back when Comcast, which is the second largest ISP in the United States, um, started injecting forged reset packets uh, into BitTorrent and other peer-to-peer -peer connections, and also some other protocols that their firewalls just randomly confused for peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, so Lotus Notes, I think, was having its connections reset and other stuff like that. Um, so. So that Comcast back then was doing that very blatantly, and a number of other ISPs were. Uh, and we ran the first controlled tests that confirmed it, that it was definitely Comcast doing this um, by collecting data from, from both ends of the connection. Uh, and that led to um, the FCC, uh, the Federal Communications Commission, uh, attempting to uh, establish authority over um, of a network neutrality in order to prevent Comcast um, from being able to, to do this kind of thing. Um, and there's been a huge like, kind of side argument about whether the FCC has the legal authority to do this and whether they're the right institution to do it. Um, but the state of play at the moment is that um, all overtly US ISPs have kind of agreed not to do this sort of thing. Uh, and they've tended to be sued and uh, run into trouble when, when they have done it. So if you're aware of a US ISP that is definitely throttling, differentially throttling traffic um, to one domain versus another, um, that's a really interesting thing to come and talk to us about. Um, to, or just draw attention to, uh, and it will tend, just drawing attention to it will tend to get the problem fixed. Because I think that uh, US ISPs have, uh, are under a lot of pressure not to do this kind of thing. 
Internationally, um, the situation is more varied. Uh, there are a handful of countries, such as the Netherlands, that have actually passed explicit network neutrality laws. So in those countries, it's outright illegal to do this kind of thing, um, whereas in the US, it's more complicated. Uh, and there are some places where it's more overtly just, OK, we're, we're doing it and getting away with it. Um, and so I think what the internet community needs to do uh, is catch companies that are doing it, draw attention to it, uh, and make sure it stops. All right, uh, on the edge there with the EFF hat. Uh, how often, if at all, are you engaged by the legislature and your staff during the board of drafting? And do they listen to what you're saying? So the question is how often uh, are we engaged by uh, legislatures and their staff um, when uh, uh, they're crafting legislation uh, and, and drafting it? Um, I think I can, uh, I'll take that. Um, fairly often. Um, we, we have some contacts uh, in D.C. Our, our main focus for, for advocacy is more on the litigation establishing precedent side of things. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, we have had some good communications uh, with uh, some uh, people back in uh, D.C. Uh, over the language of, of bills. Do they listen? Well, I mean, they, they, they listen. They don't necessarily do what we ask them to do. Uh, but you know they, their, their staffers will make the time to be on a on a call with us, uh, or at least some of them, not all. Uh, and then uh, we also, uh, uh, from time to time, will get involved at uh, uh, state legislative uh, levels, um, and also uh, uh, have some of our international team uh, working on things like uh, EU directives and um, some of the um, sort of semi legislation that occurs out in that uh, in that sphere. Um, one great story of this sort, it, there's a big difference between talking to people, which people tend to talk to us. Sometimes uh, they even you know, come to us and then write a bill based on stuff that we tell them, but th then there's this whole other question of whether the bill passes and becomes law, uh, and most of the time it doesn't. And then there are times when uh, people in government and in Congress come to talk to us, uh, but don't listen. So uh, a good example of this was Koika and Soper and Pippa, the various internet blacklist bills, where they came to us and said, you know, we need to censor websites in order to, uh, they didn't say censor, we need to take down these websites in order to enforce copyright law. And we said, no, you don't. That's a terrible idea. You should definitely not do this. Uh, and they didn't listen to us. They continued to try and uh, pass those bills. And so then we ended up uh, basically with the, uh, the giant uh, political campaign that we, we and a number of other groups ran against Soper and Pippa uh, that culminated with Blacklist Day, and, and we won. Uh, so sometimes they don't listen to us, but we win anyway. Thank you. Um, and, and thanks, for, I mean, I'm sure many of you were, were, were participants in, in the fight on SOPA, and I think it's worth calling out, and, and thanks for the, the claps there. That was a watershed moment in, in trying to put some uh, sanity into what Congress did. Uh, one of the first times where Congress was really coming forward with a, a really bad bill, uh, and uh, they were t being told by the content industry, you know, this is fine. Everyone on the Hill was saying this is a done deal, and the only question is how bad is it going to be? And through uh, massive grassroots support, uh, it was turned around. So that was a really great thing. And it's important to point out that after uh, SOPA and PIPA went down, they listen to us a lot more now. Uh, sir, the, Ed, there you had a hand up for a while. The, the question is, what is the current state of encryption keys and being asked to give up your password uh, and the Fifth Amendment? So um, for those interested in this issue, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak about this briefly, but I have a, an hour-long talk about this later this afternoon, and so I don't want to take all of the, I don't want to steal my own thunder here <laughs> and have you all just not come because you're like, oh, okay, I got the deal then. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Two o'clock, right here. Two o'clock. So um, this is a, a really interesting question. Uh, basically, the issue is um, the, the, the privilege against self-incrimination, which we uh, get from the, the Fifth Amendment, um, which uh, ensures that, that witnesses have a right to remain silent and not, not, be, uh, not have things that they, they say be used against them. Um, 
and how that uh, how that affects uh, attempts by the government to force people to disclose passwords or uh, encryption passphrases or um, you know simply compel them to decrypt data and then turn over um, a, a version that the government can can then read and use and there have been a couple of big cases on this in the in the past couple of years and I, I think that the the rule uh, that we can see from this new precedent is that you know if you have a a, a valid Fifth Amendment um, privilege uh, meaning you know the government is trying to force you to um, uh, make a testimonial communication that would reveal things in your mind that would tend to incriminate you. Um, y you can have a valid privilege um, that that keeps the government from forcing you to decrypt your data. However, this can have limits, um, and uh, the, the case that uh, that was decided uh, first this year, um, you know, basically said, you know, listen, if there is a situation where the government already has a pretty good sense of what is, uh, what that data is and that you have control over it and um, custody over it and um, it can, you know, the, it can be authenticated in some other way, then, um, you know, really they're not forcing you to say much more than they already know. And um, in that case you might not have a valid Fifth Amendment privilege. So that's kind of the story there. If you want to hear more explanation about it, come this afternoon, please. All right, another question. Um, in the back, EFF hat. Um, what, uh, so the question is what is EFF's uh, position on uh, the deployment of drones? Is it offensive? Domestic deployment of drones. Trevor? So uh, in February the, the uh, Congress passed a bill called the FAA Modernization Act and buried in this bill is a clause that says the FAA has to start issuing drone licenses to public agencies including law enforcement agencies. And uh, the FAA itself estimates that by the end of the decade there may be as many as 30,000 drones flying in the U.S. And so these drones aren't, um, you know, going to be shooting missiles, but they will be able to do pretty much everything else that military drones are capable of, whether it's um, surveillance, you know, flying for hours or days at a time. You know, some of the, the drones, the military drones can, um, you know, scan entire cities and alternatively, uh, you know, see the color of your shoelaces from a mile away. Um, but they can also be equipped with facial recognition software, um, fake cell phone towers that can uh, intercept text messages or phone calls or um, crack Wi-Fi. Or, you know, a Texas sheriff even suggested that he wanted uh, to put less lethal weapons, he called them, on drones like rubber bullets and tasers for crowd control. Um, so, you know, the, the dangers are, are, are kind of unprecedented, especially in the privacy area where, you know, there's aren't, there aren't really laws that protect us against this type of surveillance. When you walk outside your home, you could potentially be, be followed by a drone for 24-7. Um, so we've actually been working a lot in this area uh, over the last six months. We filed a Freedom of Information Act lawsuit against the FAA. They were actually keeping uh, who had the authorizations to fly drones secret even though if you fly a man manned aircraft, uh, the FAA is actually very transparent. They tell you, uh, you know, who's flying it, what type uh, of plane it is, and, uh, you know, a lot of details about, about its, um, how it operates. Uh, but they didn't do that with drones at all. So we had to sue them, and they re released a list a few months ago um, that detailed uh, about 60 public agencies that have drones. Uh, now it's about up to 100, uh, but again, that's about to explode because of this law. Um, so actually we're running a, because the FAA only really told us uh, who was flying them, we don't know what they're using them for. Um, so what we're doing now is we're running a campaign with an open government group called Muckrock. And you can go to their w website at muckrock.com. And we're trying to file a public records request with every police agency in the U.S. that either has a drone authorization or wants to get one. So we've already filed with everybody on the FAA list and we're trying to ask them what are they doing with these drones? What do they want to do with them? What kind of type of surveillance are they going to 
to use with them. Uh, and then we're also going to ask um, your local police station. So you can actually go to muckrock.com and fill out the simple form, and they will file a public records request on your behalf, and they'll do all the, the legal trouble and all the, the tough stuff. All you have to do is just fill out uh, fill it out with your information and your local police agency's information and you can find out um, hopefully if they have plans to uh, get a uh, domestic surveillance drone. And so once that um, we gather enough information um, in that regard, we hope to uh, take this information and take it to local city councils or uh, municipal governments or state governments or even Congress uh, so they can pass legislation that can uh, really set up you know, robust privacy safeguards. So if drones are being used to follow somebody that they have a warrant first, and there's already a couple bills in Congress going around right now, we don't know how much support they have, but that say generally this, uh, this idea. Um, and hopefully our goal at least is to stop this before it becomes a problem and to uh, kind of have this legislation be, imp be implemented before there is a drone flying over every town in the US. All right. Thank you. So the, the follow-up is, are there any private organizations that are on the FAA list? Uh, not yet. Uh, right now, only public agencies can get uh, drone authorizations, but that's going to change in 2015, uh, according to the, the bill that Congress passed that I just mentioned. Uh, in 2015, commercial um, entities can start getting drone licenses, so you can, you, we might start seeing uh, you know, FedEx flying a fleet of drones to deliver packages across the U.S. Okay. Uh, in the black shirt, fourth row. I feel like everybody who supports the EFF has some responsibility to have been passed for others to promote the concepts of your coffee goods. But I find when I'm talking to people who are of a better off social standing, who are benefit from the status quo, for them, from the smart tapping and a lot of things that are happening, are tools that help maintain their comfort. How do we engage them and appeal to their personal interests in supporting the objective of the EFF? Uh, so the question is um, uh, how to reach out to, to people who might be uh, satisfied with the status quo and to speak to them about uh, some of the troubles and why they should be opposed to things like warrantless uh, wiretapping and how do, you, how do you communicate with those groups? So, you know, this is a really interesting question and I think we saw a little bit of this in January um, in the U.S. Supreme Court. When in, in January, the, U, the U.S. Supreme Court issued a decision called uh, U.S. v. Jones that talked about the physical installation of a GPS device on a car. And um, the Supreme Court held that that type of installation was uh, unreasonable and in violation of the Fourth Amendment. Uh, well, that it, it held that it was a search under the Fourth Amendment. And because in that instant case that the court was considering, it was done without a warrant, it was uh, unconstitutional. What was interesting about that case was during the oral argument, Chief Justice Roberts, who I would certainly say is a man of, uh, I don't know, higher standing or whatever you want to call it, um, asked the government attorney in that case whether under the government's interpretation of the law, if they could install a GPS device on every single person of, every single member of the Supreme Court's car, to which the government attorney rightfully answered as they argued in their brief, yes. And um, naturally the Supreme Court unanimously said no and, um, <laughs> you know, found the search unreasonable, you know, found that the installation of the GPS, GPS device was a search. But I think that really kind of captures how we can approach these technical concepts to people who may not necessarily be worried about it. You know, in the Jones case, the defendant they were surveilling was a guy who was a suspected drug dealer, and he ultimately got sentenced to life in prison. Um, so, you know, this is kind of going back to your question, you know, this is somebody who maybe society may not think really deserves a break. Um, but I think when the technology got boiled down to a, a uh, got boiled down to a way and explained in a way where nine elderly members of society who are Supreme Court justices, who are pretty highly ranked members of our society, can recognize like, hey, you know what, it's a bad idea if we let the cops just put GPS devices on anybody they want, wherever they want, for however long they want. That's when change starts to happen. And I think the way that gets done is both through 
just people like you talking to your friends and, and talking to maybe like your parents and people of an older generation who may not be as familiar with the technology and help them explain, hey, you know what, remember how you, when you put a, a letter in the mail you don't expect the post office to open the letter and read it, you just expect them to deliver it? Shouldn't the same thing happen or be true of our email? Um, and I think all of us here, I think we all try to do that. We all try to explain these kind of complicated or not so complicated but you know concepts that are relatively new to an audience of, of judges and legislators who may not necessarily appreciate them. And I think as that happens more and more that's where you're going to start to see a, a change in societal values. Another example, just very briefly and I'll stop talking, um, like in the cell site location data, I think about a year ago uh, I think you know everyone at DEF CON may know what cell site location data information is but the general public probably didn't and you didn't have a lot of major media companies covering it. But in the last four or five months we saw as a result of the ACLU's FOIA request where they got all this information about it and as a result of some poking around by some con congress members to different cell phone companies about hey how many requests are you getting uh, from you know law enforcement when the number came out and it's the, the number that was reported was 1.3 million requests in 2011 and there have been some people who have suggested that that number is actually closer to 1.5 million. Um, once that number comes out and the Wall Street Journal runs an article about it and the New York Times runs an article about it and congressional leaders are starting to ask questions, that's when you know people are starting to take notice. So that, that's, that's how that change has to happen. Uh, just to add on to that a little bit. Um, I think a lot of the times the problem is uh, with people that are, you know, not W that wouldn't attend this conference that may not know a lot about technology or the internet is the way that the, the problem is framed. So when they hear uh, things like the Stop Online Piracy Act, they think, oh, that's people downloading music and movies and we're against that, so we're obviously for this bill. But what they don't understand just by the title and uh, maybe by reading one news article about it is how broad the bill is and how it could affect millions of people who have never even thought about copyright infringement and could censor um, thousands of websites that could have just gotten caught up in a broad sweep um, of whether it was the attorney general or corporations doing the censorship. Um, so it, I think it's important to kind of explain to people in more detail about how bills work rather than what they're called. Uh, another example is uh, the data retention bill which actually uh, just got dropped in Congress. Um, there, the author of SOPA, Lamar Smith, uh, had this bill that was called, I don't remember the exact name, but it was essentially Stop um, Child Pornographers Act. Um, but w and so what it would do, it would force ISPs to keep uh, your data for a year or 18 months um, so that law enforcement could access it whenever it wants. And now, you know, this would have applied to everybody, not just uh, investigations regarding child pornography. Um, so often they use these buzz words that people will just attach to uh, without thinking much uh, when in, in fact it, they actually affect a far broader uh, group of people. And so it's, it's tough to get past that. Um, but that's, that would be the lesson is to try to explain to them how a bill works rather than uh, just what it's called or what it's trying to stop. Uh, yes, sir. So the question is uh, how do we respond to people who think we are all tin foil hatters? Um, you know, I mean we, we try and uh, make sure that everything that we do is, is backed up and sourced and uh, is, is quite reasonable. I mean I, I would say uh, uh, you know one of the things where this was coming up a lot was in the question of whether uh, the NSA was engaged in, in uh, massive surveillance. And it was very, very helpful uh, to have uh, a, a whistleblower who could say that they were actually involved in installing the splitter in a, in a secret room and in the Folsom Street facility. Uh, but in, in the early stages of that, um, there were some um, questions as to how we could make that uh, information public and, and originally it was all filed under seal. And so there were some awkward times in the beginning where, yeah, we, we were, one of our uh, staffers was on uh, uh, Fox News and was uh, uh, getting interrogated by uh, Cavuto, uh, you know, where's your proof? Where's your proof? And of course we, we did have the proof but at that point we couldn't uh, uh, make, it, uh, make it public.
Uh, so the, the question is, is whether EFF has experienced uh, intimidation or, or shady uh, uh, experiences, um, and I mean I, I have not. Uh, you know I, I've not had any particular screening problems at the TSA or you know strange vans outside my house or anything like that. Uh, but I guess uh, is anyone? I've never um, experienced anything like that, and in fact I tend to think that just maybe maybe logically maybe we're even you know more protected <laughs> from that kind of thing than other people because if anybody did intimidate us or you know you know try to make us feel uncomfortable um, I think that would be a really big press story most likely um, and so I, I tend to not have worries like that um, you know largely because I work at EFF so uh, I was just given the, uh, the one minute warning, so uh, we're going to halt the questions from now, but they will continue in the Q&A session, uh, which I believe is across the hall in a small room setting, so if you have further questions, uh, you can come there. We'll also be around for the rest of the weekend. We have uh, a booth over in the vendor area uh, where many of us will come by to hang out. There's also another booth over at the uh, Hackers with Guns uh, shooting game, so you can support EFF shoot guns and, and see us at the booth there. Uh, so we hope to see you all around uh, the conference uh, for the rest of the weekend. And thank you so much for coming. It's been wonderful that we've been doing this for eight years. Thank you.